Timber framing is an attractive way to personalize and customize your home, your office space, your recreation area, anything, anything that has to do with building and space you're gonna enjoy. But how much does it cost? Short answer, an arm and a leg. Really, it costs more. Hello, so I'm Bert Sarkinen. I'm the author of the newly re re released book here, The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. And we've got a bonus for you regarding this at the end of this, so stick around if you've got time. So cost, about timber framing cost. Within my industry, we have a little bit of idealism. I'm a little bit of an idealist. I would hope against hope and really wish that timber framing could be on par or less than conventional building methods. It's not true. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to really tear this apart, come at it from one way or the other, and really dissect and understand what is going on here, okay? One of the things that we're going to do for you is we're gonna front load these takeaways here so that if you do have to bounce, that you can have some high level information that you can use with your planning, your timber frame journey, moving forward and so forth. There is, I am doing this a great personal risk. I'm gonna share with you what that is when I disclose these numbers and give you this information without being the friendly guide to help you understand what it means to you, how can you apply it and make the most of it with options that you have available. There's another piece of information that you're really gonna to wanna to have before you bounce as well. But first, as promised, I'm going to cover this front loaded end. Then we're gonna go into kind of a freestyle section here. After that, feel free to enter in questions you might have and we'll interrupt the show to give you answers. So we'll take rabbit holes as required or as queued up by the content that we cover here. And really, if you were gonna take the heart and liver of the value you might get from here, the applied numbers aren't really going to mean so much. These tips that I'm gonna give you, they'll give you some random things, but it's not going to give you an intuitive feel. So we're gonna go through many real world project examples so that at the end of this, you kind of have a gut feeling of what things might run, as well as you have internalized these warnings of how to apply these without following your project up. And then these, the endless well of ideas and you having the power, these are kind of connected. We're gonna cover that. And then avoiding ugly money situations. Definitely this is gonna be kind of what this is about in an oblique sense. Okay, I mentioned the bonus, so we're gonna cover that. And speaking of question and answer, this is to prime your mind right now because we want to answer every question that's on your mind, give you the best information you can possibly get here. So I'm just going to read a couple of these here. Do my gables look naked? Where do I draw the line? Big influence on cost. How much you're going to invest? Why is it so hard to get a price on timber framing? This we're actually gonna cover a little bit in the front end, but if you have further questions, type them in the chat and we will handle them as soon as we get past this front portion. Fair enough. Okay, ready to dive in? How much, how much? 417 per pound. So that's a little bit of a joke. In other words, Builders, a lot of times, if they're asked, how much do you charge a square foot to build? They'll say, well, I don't know. How much does a car cost by the pound? That's, there's so many factors to consider in buying a car that buying a car by weight doesn't make sense. It's a little bit the same with a house or anything of quality that has complex variables. And so this was a, a variation of that. But if you're going to do the math with this, if you go 4.17 times 3.33, where does 3.3 come in? This is green dug fir for at per board foot. It weighs about 3.3 pounds per board foot. Now, the advantage is if you buy in the summertime, 
you're going to get a much better deal than if you buy in the winter, right? <laughs> so if you do the math here, you're going to end up close to 15 bucks a board foot. Okay, great. This number here, since since we had the COVID and the sawmill problems and lumber prices and general mass money printing, this number is already in a few short years obsolete. So 15 is no longer relevant. You're going to be looking for artistically designed beams that fit your style, that are magnetic, beautiful, balanced. You're going to be between 15 and 22 per board foot. So that's one piece of information, but how do you apply that? What is a board foot? A board foot is a piece of wood. Some of you may remember back to shop class. It's one by 12 by 12. Hark, the dog agrees with me too. Okay. So if we've got a beam, just say a post, eight by eight by 10 foot long. How many board feet is in an eight by eight, 10 foot long? Here's the math. Go eight times eight times 10, which is gonna be 64, 640. 640 divided by 12. So what is that five point something, 50, 54, let's just say it's 54 board feet. And if we go 54 to make it easy using 20, that's going to be doubled, so we're going to go 10, 8. So 1,080 using 20 as a multiplier. Make sense so far? So that, and so what, what is going to be the big variables that press and you know, put you on one end of that or the other? And of course, there's outliers. I mean, no rule of thumb is absolutely true 100% of the time. So what are the, the two things to remember with what will drive cost up? Actually, three. So three things to remember that will drive the cost up is the board foot itself. So we're going to put quantity. because That's number one. Number two is... Complexity and the third one is big material. It just we were using big logs, quality material, and this isn't your average stuff that you're gonna go find in the in the lumber yard. For years, I was a res residential framer, framing contractor, and I didn't know good material. I really didn't. When I, after getting into the timber frame industry, I look back and it's like, wow, the things that I didn't know about wood. But anyway, so those are your big, big drivers. So that's, you cross that one off. Okay, five twenty. Five to 20% more, what does that mean? So let's just say that this is a pretty easy multiplier. Let's just say that you're gonna spend 800,000 on your home. Well, if you're gonna, so, so then your timber framing piece, as we mentioned, it's an extra item on your, you've got carpet, you've got foundation, you got groundwork, you've got gravel, road, whatever. There's one extra line in there for timber framing. So it will cost more. And how much more that is five to twenty percent more. So if you were to take say even ten percent, you'd say eighty thousand dollars for a timber frame for, for a timber frame package. And this is hybrid timber frame. So it's a little bit different than a full timber frame, but regardless, it's gonna apply on the big picture here. So you pick a number between five and 20%. And we really, just for your information, if you were, if you and me talking eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly, talking about your plan and your ideas and the pieces you point and pick at that you want are driving you beyond 20%, 
I'm going to <clears throat> ah, time out. Urge. Is this really what you want? Is beyond that, things can kind of get upside down unless it really is design driven and not budget driven, which is another point that's going to really drive cost is where you're going. If you're design driven versus budget, you know, they're two different things, two different animals. And so some pe most people are somewhere in the middle. And that, that's going to, if you're somewhere in the middle, these, 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 these factors that I'm sharing with you will generally apply. Okay. So let's talk about your square footage of the area that you're going to be timber framing. So this one right here. If you've got, let's just say you've got an entry of a certain size that's here, and then you got your little foyer, and then it breaks off to a, a great room, and then maybe off the kitchen you got an outdoor living area. So if we were to tally up the square footage, let's just say 300 and 400 and another 300, that puts us at a thousand square feet. And so using the complexity factors I mentioned earlier, that how much wood is it complex and are they big oversized pieces? Are we really big? Then we get to choose, you know, do we choose a hundred for the most expensive or 20, which would be just some few pieces, just enough to give it a, just a little flavor that would give us an idea. So we would be somewhere in the $20,000 range versus times 10 there, you know, you're at uh, 100,000, or is it? So there's another tool you can use, try to extrapolate again, stick around for the caveat because I don't want you getting in trouble with this, all right? Another way you can do this is simply $300 to $2,000 per piece of wood. So you count up the pieces you think you want, just roughly blah, 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 big and small, lump them all together, times the multiplier you think you're going to land. And as a, we have seven styles in the book. As a general rule, modern style will have less timber and be lower on the spectrum than say rustic. Rustic is probably gonna be on the very highest because that's really where you get a high, qual high quantity of timbers and they tend to be bigger. And so traditional would kind of maybe be somewhat on the, maybe like a four out of 10, craftsman and classic, maybe a six or a seven. So there's another little tip for you to take away. You will need a book to use this or use our examples online. And then we're going to get into programming your intuition with the stuff we cover later. So now I would like to cover the caveats for you. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That is one reason that uh, it's really hard to get a price from, from not only timber framers, but also other service providers. When I'm giving you these numbers right now, I really run the risk, here's where my personal risk comes in, I really run the risk of chasing you away when in fact, your project might be well within realistic expectations for both of us. We might be a match made in heaven, but you see 100,000 bucks or you see 200,000 bucks and it's like, whew, whoa, Nelly, okay, no timber framing or else I'm gonna have, just get some lumber from the lumber yard and do it myself and get scared away from something that could be, where you could really get something artistic and beautiful and that fits your style and uncover gems that you had no idea you knew you could have, okay? And on the other side of it, if you were to go into it without getting scared away, for example, and we could design something up and set expectations and where you just love it, but then, huh, the money hasn't been addressed and you have to abandon dreams and or cough up some more money, you know, that's pain on the other side. So as service provider, specialty contractor, timber framer, you know, my goal is to manage 
that communication, and when I spill the beans like I've done right here ahead of time, I run the risk of having this communication run away and ah, you, wait, you don't quite understand it. And now, okay, blam, off the cliff, and there we are. Whole bunch of pain. So that's the number one point with this information that we really need to have some professional guidance to apply this information. So what do I mean by professional guidance? Seven styles. In the book, here they are. Bing, 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 bing. Okay, so you have seven styles. Your style will probably be a combination of this right here. Usually we see two or three traits from styles that people will land on. So if we go three, that's 21. Now, here you see, this is also in the book in the Managing the Money chapter. You've got this space right here. Just take a close look. Every, nothing has changed. The room is the same size. The walls are the same, the same height. The pitch does not change. Okay. And yet, look at all the different look and feels you can get here. Okay. You with me so far? So we've got 15 of these. Okay. So what is 15 times 21? It's a lot. Okay. Now, if we start changing how wide we are, or maybe we're long and narrow, or we change wall heights and roof pitches, the what you can get and a look and feel where you can land and the, the tools, the control knobs you have to really exquisitely dial this around to get your price point, to hit your look and feel is kind of overwhelming. There's a lot going on, right? So that's where that that professional guidance is really going to help you dial in your investment, your look and feel, to where you get something that really puts a smile on your face for a long time. So I kind of am rather passionate about getting things right for people. So I really like to dig into what's going on, what's the just the right amount. I hate to see things that get put up without a lot of thought. And it's just so extremely wasteful. It just oh, hurts. And so that's where, so we have 21 times 15, a lot of options. That's point number two. And then the other point is you are the visionary. You are in control of this process. Now, if you hire the wrong contractor without putting a lot of thought into it, and then go and carp uh, you know, how crappy contractors are, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, the, it, 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 it's a tango. It's a two-way dance. So my exhortation to you is to really make sure that you understand what you want, why you want it, and then how you want to make it happen. And all that, the, the why, the what, and the how, that really is – Right here in the first five chapters, that is for you, the visionary. And if you do that, your chances of investing in something wasteful is going to be really minimized. So that is my gift to the timber frame industry. It feels good to do this. And you know, garbage in, garbage out. That, that's an incredible takeaway. Garbage in, garbage out. And now... As just a quick example of garbage in, garbage out, this perhaps, you know, this to the naked eye to someone who really doesn't know stuff, this looks fine. This is a project I just happened by. It's also in the book. So here's what Daddy Long Legs refers to. You see this right here? You have a huge mass here. And there's, I mean, it's almost like it's floating. I mean, it's almost like it's disconnected. There's nothing to visually ground this project. So there's a lot of different things that we do with timber design. Part of it you see, which is a timber frame itself. And a lot of it, nobody sees after the project is done because it's like editing. You don't see what's not there or what's been changed. 
So as an example, I'm just going to show you some stuff that I would try if this were your project and you told me to beautify this. Of course, I would first understand where you want to go, what you want it to feel like, get a good understanding of that so I'm not driving what I think is best. I'm just kind of poking and pushing and understanding what you want. Here's some things that would help this get balanced, all right? So with this here, first thing I would look at is perhaps lowering this roof here on the garage. All right. And then it eliminates a little bit of space here. This no longer becomes quite as prominent. And the arch, this arch doesn't quite have enough character for make it a little bit steeper. And these corbels, instead of having a horizontal detail like that, I would go for something that comes down a little bit more and gives kind of a little bit more substantial bracing feel. And it kind of also brings this down to where it's somewhat whole, all right? Now with the entry, I would kind of take a little bit of a different approach here. I would actually just pull this entry rope out maybe with posts here. I might raise a stone to raising the stone can trick your eye to seeing more mass and perhaps might angle the outsides of those posts. That throws your eye out. It feels more stable. But I would focus on making the entry the entry and this could you could do a lot of things with this piece here. You could you could bring that back to where it's got a like a Dutch gable and maybe a little timber accent here. So you got some roofing right there. This post here, I would make it substantial enough. I might drop the stone from these two so that this is your prominent. This captures your eye first. This still needs to be heavy enough and ground the mass, but it it can't steal the show, it can't distract. And again, with the garage, we don't want that distracting either. So in order of visual hierarchy, you might say, this would be number one, this is number two, and then this piece and that piece combined would be number three. So that is an example of applied timber art. And you can see that if you if you had if this was you, your friends and stuff coming over to your place, they would say, wow, timbers look beautiful. They wouldn't see the canvas prep, dropping the roof, raise the this is the, the arch is the timber piece, but also re reimagining this roof line to make a place for the timbers to just shine. So that makes sense so far. Are we with me? Cool. And in the book, you'll see this photo here, so you don't have to take notes. Um, I guess I didn't, I threw in a little piece about the extra roof if you wanted. There's a lot of different twists and turns you can do. Okay, free to bounce. You are set with the high level stuff and the warning that goes with it. So I think you're well equipped. And now we're gonna dig into just pictures, a bunch of pictures and go through there. Good enough, and now is a great time. If you've got any questions, I'm gonna pause for just a little bit. If you've got any questions, ty type them in, and uh, we'll take them as they come in. I got a trustworthy sidekick, Lucas, here. He's awesome, managing everything for me. He'll sound in. Okay, we've got a smaller project. I'm gonna go through these pictures here. This is more of kind of like a rustic style on a smaller starter home, okay? So our passion is to apply timber art where it's gonna be appreciated and enjoyed for a long time. Big or small, that's really what we're about. Here's one where it's stripped down a little bit, okay? And then you've got one in the middle, and I'm gonna give you a kind of a, a visual here with, you should have, there, okay. All right, so you've got, this one is obviously gonna be more money, right? You've got your little trusses on the gable accents. 
You got some corbels in there, bigger light blocks. You've got the roof over here, a little bit of the same roof line twist that we did on that other example. So you've got an extra little beam over here plus the porch. So that's obviously a little more and going to be more investment. Now, this one here is somewhere in the middle, and then this one is really simplified. And we don't really know the sweet spot. We kind of put these out here, and we let people decide this stuff with their eye first, what they like. And then, of course, we apply the money and make sure the money works. But if you were doing this project right here, I'm going to pull from memory. I think we were somewhere around, I'm going to do this all installed, even though this one was a kit. So this one went out, and so you save about 30% with when, when it's a kit, when we don't do the install. This one here is around 25 grand. Okay. And so maybe just a touch up or a touch down. This is about where you're at for that one. Okay. Small project. So that's one piece of intuition you have for you. Okay, here's a medium-sized project, and this one also went through design iterations with more and less timbers. And this one, I can't really give you a number right now until you see kind of the overview. There's a back patio, there's stuff on the inside. And this is a combination of classic and European. A little bit, you see the the, the piece is coming out. You can see this could down, but it almost be a little bit like applied to like a Hansel and Gretel house, Grimm Brothers, that sort of thing. So this one is one of the first ones we did. This is the, the lesser option here. Let's see, greater than, less than, I think is like it. Uh, so less timbers, the other pieces here, you notice on that first one, this gable was quite a bit bigger. They had more beams coming out. And uh, the bag, and then that applied through the rest of the home as well. So here's an overview. This is visible enough here. So you can see we've got a pretty sizable patio back here. We've got the trusses in here, and then the then then the pad, the entry itself, as well as a few things in the entry and the, the kitchen here. So this, I believe, was the, the you know, level one. This here goes to a level two. We've got the posts have become bigger. We've got more ornate, steeper arch. The gable details stayed about the same. And the pieces in here, looks like uh, one of the beams got hidden. But in this here in the back, pretty much stayed the same, got a little bit bigger. So this was like level two in the middle. And then here we have level three. This one really did a number. It was kind of funny, the iteration of how this progressed and the owner's behest, right? Just every time, I'm just always amazed with creativity. We just had another project the other day where Dred drew something up for a hot tub cover and he came back and no, we missed the mark. But the, so what the owners had won, and I'm like, oh, come on, man. How are we going to make that look good? That's going to look like crap. But get to it. You know, you roll up your sleeves, you start pushing ideas and playing around, pushing and pulling. And wow, we got something that was better than the first one. Really cool. I'll share that sometime. And, and the same thing here. They wanted something else. They wanted to go. They wanted to pull the stops. Like if you were going to make this just really fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel, European, what would you do? Well, this is what we came up with. And of course, this is going to be your biggest investment, but it jolly well could provide the most value. You know, where do you want to go? So over time, this might just be the sweet spot. And I suspect this is where we're going to land. This is a project that is in process right now. And uh, really fun to work with people and see where things end up and have that forced creativity. It's very rewarding. Okay, here we here we can see the same things. You can see the great room got a little bit more. And now this here is huh, are we at 180? 
you know, with everything all in, it's somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. And then, so you're going to step down. I think you get down to about 90 for the first version. So it just progressively moves up. So, so you see there's the owners have the control knobs, right? <laughs> they get to put it where they want. And we as guys get to poke and pull. All right, yeah, so we will, just for clarity, give or take, I mean, we're talking high level numbers at this point. There is good information. Okay. Installed it, yeah. This install, we're talking all installed here, all installed numbers. And then 30% less. If you want to install yourself, 30% less, but sometimes we say, no way, Jose, this is too complicated. It's just not, it's going to be heartache for both of us. So just keep that in mind if it's simple enough, or if there's somebody vetted that we know can install a project, that's, that's a different matter. So it's best to start off with this. And these also, these numbers that I'm throwing out here include one coat of stain, which can be taken on or off. And there's some other things in there, but it's, it's better to talk global and pull things out rather than try to squeak you in the door talking these tight little numbers and then keep piling more and more on. You're going to think I'm a crook and nickel and diming and blah, blah, blah. Don't want it. So we're talking big numbers, total package, all installed. Okay. Right. Okay, so here we have, if you can see this, you got a few different options. This is going to be your biggest number. This one has less wood, metal. Keep in mind, if you like the look of metal, it reduces the amount of wood, but it really doesn't save money generally. In general, metal does not save money. It usually costs more. And then here's another one with different different style of truss here, a little bit more industrial, but well, we'll get into that. And that one's kind of middle of the road. Although those two could be neck and neck. Sometimes they change styles and you really don't save a lot, but it's the look that you want. So one thing that's going on here is four posts on the corners. And that's going to drive a lot of board footage up. Generally, it's a look that I try to stay away from. Uh, it's, it's a look that is a little bit of run-of-the-mill, Home Depot look. You see a lot of architects don't want to put time into the timbers. They don't have to buy a big timber. They slap four things together, throw some bolts through it. Carpenter can handle it. Done, out the door, don't have to see it. And that's a great business model. It's just not where my heart's at. I'm... I'm more of let's get this right, let's make it artistic, let's make it for you. And so, of course, I have to be the starving artist trying to defend a high price. But the defensive thing is not where I want to be. It is what it is, and we got plenty of work. And so it just really feels good to just have the freedom to create and make this long-lasting value for people. Next picture. So you can see this goes quite a ways back. You got the front, there's, it goes out to the front porch. You know, this is gonna be in your $200,000 range. And all three of the exa examples are gonna hit about right there. Because you got metal on some, you got, this is a little simplified, but you got extra posts. The next version, the next version you have less posts, you don't have the metal, but you look at the complexity of that arch, and these posts do grow quite a bit in size. So I myself really like this particular one here. Now I'm gonna switch gears for you, and just because it's the perfect place to talk about a design tip that can help you when you're doing a patio, okay? So you can see here that vaulted truss above the, above this here, there's a vaulted, a vaulted truss is going to carry all the way back. So the reason some builders will go for this is it's much simpler to have manufactured trusses 
that look like this with webbing all the way through. And this is a parallel cord scissor truss. Then you don't have to get all the engineering and have the everything go through like that. So you can save, oh, maybe 20% on the timbers if you do that. And the other place that you save on this is whenever a framer sees hand cut, ding, cash register, immediately double the square, square foot price for, for hand cut roof, which even though it's just stacking rafters over timbers that are there, that's kind of the, the programming and you know they have to a lot of times absorb the square footage of the garage at no extra cost. So so they have a valid axe to grind with this. So you've got the cost of the, the timber, the framer going hand cut and then dollar signs, right? And then you have the, the savings of 20% of the timber cost when we don't have to go through the engineering and make it hold everything up, that between the two of those, you can, if you've got a lot of, got a lot going on, you can run into some, some substantial savings. So this is the, this is the, the scissor here. One of the things that happens with design that when you get scissor trusses, especially with scissor trusses that look like so, you really, no matter what you do, it, it just really, this, this whole thing is not a good look. And so you'll see these rafters here are tapered. And all it needs is that little fix. When you taper some rafters here, it takes away this imbalance and things start to look whole again because you've added mass here. If you go with a, a straight rafter all the way down, you still have that, that narrowing balance. It just doesn't look right. So something to balance that out with your eye is just really a, a little jewel you can take away from this. Something tapered will balance things out. It's a good look. Okay. And this looks like our lesser version. Maybe we got a double slide in there. Okay, here's the one with the with the metal. So we don't have as much timbers, but I'll tell you what, when you get into metal, by the time you powder coat it, you specify what you need, it gets installed, you've used gloves, you've you, you padded your wrenches to not avoid chipping, all these different things that go into making the metal work. The savings is either a wash or more. That's that's just kind of how it is. It is what it is. For It took me two years to figure out that metal plates cost me more than regular timber framing. So I was taking a big hit every time we did metal, not knowing it. It just seems like it would be less complicated and easier to do. Now, if you are the hobbyist, you're going to do this on the weekends, or you don't have the tools for the timber framing and the joinery and that, yes, it could be less expensive and an easier way to go. And I would encourage anyone thinking about it is to come back to what am I trying to achieve and is the metal going to help or hurt that look, right? So go there first and then start doing the numbers. And I, one of my pet peeves for myself and for when I see, see this happening with, with people figuring out timber framing is letting cost kind of dictate your wants. It's much better to figure out what your wants are and then address the cost. And then if you re readdress from there, but, but that could be really cutting off a lot of avenues that could really delight and not be as expensive as you think, or maybe even save you money. We have had examples where we've had a hundred thousand bucks to work with, but the look and feel someone was really after ended up being half of that. So it does go the other way, albeit less than, Usually it goes to the more expensive side when people figure out what they want and as they get more information, they're 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 modifying their plans. But it can go either way. So so understanding what you want first before you look at the numbers is a caveat I really should have put in the front before people run off and hurt themselves with my information. Okay. And then here's the overview. Again, 200 grand. 
You see they're roughly the same in the metal, so I'll review. Alrighty, how much does this one cost? Let's take a look at all the pictures here first. Here's the front in the design model in the back. And we have a little overview here. This was an Alaska project. You might have noticed snow on the ground in the previous picture. Uh, when you have a, 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 you know, the, the, the artistic applied timber framing and the hybrid function, each of these pieces really has a lot to choreograph with it. That's another thing that is really good to keep in mind. Hybrid timber framing allows you to focus on just a certain area as opposed to a full timber frame. It does make each piece per piece cost more because there's so much coordination and design work to get that right look and feel in it. Still high, high value punch. You get so much more flexibility, hands down the way to go. Most of the timber framing that's done today is hybrid timber framing to some degree. And so, but so now we wanna know the numbers, how much, right? So, hey, does somebody wanna guess? Type it in the chat. Okay, so we've got, just so you're, while you're thinking there, We've got an entry, we've got a kind of a little, like a, a widow, widow's walk or the uh, French balcony. They got some gable detail on the front. You can see it there. We've got some complicated little stuff in the witch's hat, kind of the sunroom. You've got the great room here, working around a round stairway. You've got beams in the ceiling on the inside of the kitchen for the dining room, plus all this in the back. These posts were not our scope of work. Any guesses? And I have one guess before I disclose the number. Come on, guys. Type it in. I'll keep moving. There's the front entry. See the gable detail. Have we any guesses yet, Lucas? 50K. 50K. Warmer? Warmer? So let's see if there's any other pictures of that one. No, okay. 50K, that's fairly close. This one here is, we were 50, we were about 60 without the interior. Okay, and what we did on this one is we had the wood shipped up for the interior. When we installed, I just made it a longer install and I fabricated the interior with the framing crew. It just eliminated a lot of logistics and figuring and calculating and was kind of the value punch that we worked out on this project. So this one here was 60 and that was with shipping up to Alaska. So that's going to throw things off a bit because that wasn't, wasn't anything to sneeze at. And then we did, my install was longer and I helped the framers just work with them and kind of use them an extension of my hands and worked out all the pitches and everything. It was cold, bitter week, but we did our long hours and pretty fun. Now this is just a fun trade to be in, I gotta say. Okay, here's another project. It's a little more modern. And so I would like some guesses on this one as well. So we've got this two piece arch, it's got a scarf joint in the middle, it comes down to some corbels of metal. We've got the entry with its pieces. We've got some beams going through the kitchen. We do have beams here. And then for the last piece of information you'll need, so you have these big arch beams on the back for this patio. And you see the beams on the inside. The beams in the master did not happen. And just another photo. There's the back, and I think we have one more to give you. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I guess that this one here, this was also Alaska baby, also in the winter, the next year, in fact. Can't get away from cold fingers. Any guesses? Dun, dun, dun. This one, th these beams were big. There's another story that goes along with this. I kind of made a few mistakes, but 
creativity and a will to make things right always work. It's funny that our best tool is right here. Someone said 125 came. 125, you're being generous, thank you. Uh, this one was somewhere around 60. It's kind of the same as the other. So that's modern, so it's got a lot of impact, but not as much timbers. $60? 60K. $60. Okay, so I'm gonna just recap this a little bit. We'll get into a question and answer. So 417 per pound, how much does a car cost per pound, right? We, I think we've got that point across that there's a lot of information for you to make an informed decision on getting the best value for what you want, okay? And so that translates to 15 to 22 per board foot. All right, five to 20% more. So this is your total cost, total budget. And so if we gave the example 800K and then times 0.5 or times 0.2. Point put zero five times point two would give you a number you could kind of start with for your initial figuring. Okay, and then if you know the areas you want to timber frame, most people are not totally clear on that because it goes into where the where to draw the line. Do they want gable accents? Do they not? Do they want to extend into the kitchen? Do they really want a back patio? So these are all things that really when it round tables with, with our designers, really get some traction with that. But if you know the square footage of the areas you think you want to do, calculate the square foot and then choose a number where you think you might land, modern being closest to the low end and rustic being closest to the high end of those seven styles we talked about, there's that. Now, if you have kind of a closer idea or a little bit more detailed drawing of what your timbers are right now, you can just do multiply multiplication per piece. And the same thing would apply with modern being closer to 300 and rustic closer to the, to the 2000. And hopefully we've got your intuition program here. So that is kind of the big takeaways for the cost of timber framing. All right, one other piece on this so say, for example, you're at this number four here. This is where you're at. We have seen time and time again with the process that, that our clients have helped us develop over the years that when we run the process, that more times, more often than not, your plan will lose timbers than gain timbers because it makes sense with where you really want to go. And there's questions we ask, and it's also in the book of what is that sweet spot for you? And so it really pains me when people put in more timbers just because it kind of seems like they should be four foot OC and it's not really gonna help their cause for really, really where they wanna go. And so that piece count is could be the most devastating piece of information I could give you used in the wrong way. Just a little warning with that. Okay. We are here. So how many are we going to give away on this one? Lucas? Just one? Mm -hmm. Yep. Beautiful hardcover, seven styles. And it also comes with, it also comes with a planning guide. So it takes information from the book, it digs in deeper, it gives you exercises, and that is available on our website. And if they order on the website, does this, what's the deal on this? The planning guy comes as a bono, mm -hmm. freebie? Yeah. Okay. And it is going to be available on Amazon as well, but if you do order from the website, I'll give you my autograph as long as you're okay with the potential loss of value. Alrighty. So how do they get it, Lucas? How do they how do they win? Email Lucas at Arrow Timber. So it's email. Lucas 
L U C A S at arrowtimber.com. Mm -hmm. And just ask for the book, and one of you will be chosen. Ask for the book, and we will put it in a gyroscope and do all our things and pick one out, and one person will win. Okay. And that's for the book right there. And this comes with it. Very good. Okay, questions and answers. Okay, so I'm going to take this to the bottom. I think I covered this one already. Why is it so hard to get a price from a value provide from a service provider? And just to recap on it real quick, the reason is that a simple answer can be lethal. <coughs> you just really it can it can kill the deal or it can cause pain down the road. So it needs to come with an explanation. And how can I give an explanation if I don't know what you want? And how can I know what you want if we don't come in and talk? And so this is kind of the circular chase that something has to break. And, and the way we do that is with a 30 to 90 minute brainstorm, get some real information. And that's uh, handled by Josh and Darren on our team. They do a great job eliciting that information. And then I'm with the design team on the back end. We just go to town having fun with ideas and it's really a good show. But so that's why information is hard to get. And that's why I'm taking a risk giving you that information. But hopefully it's been padded with enough caveats and information that you know that you're not going to run with sharp knives or forks or the sharp edges and that sort of thing. Okay, so do my gables look naked? Where do I draw the line? This is a huge contributor to cost. Like you've seen in many of these examples that we've covered, you've got one that is less timbers, one that's way more, one that's in the middle. And that, where is that? How are the timbers gonna influence the space? What is the look and feel you're after? Should you continue into here? When is it too much? One example I give a lot of times is the youngster, it's typically young teenage boys, that will get a pickup, and it's cool, they put on mags, they put their wheels, whatever they're gonna do, and then they got the little things over the windows and pretty soon they got roll bars and it just kind of grows and it kind of just becomes too much. It's ah! And that happens in our design process, but pulling back so you get it too pimped out and back it off and where that sweet spot is, is up to you. And we're just kind of poking and pushing and giving ideas and seeing what resonates and then once we find something that resonates and we look at the costs and then maybe we have to back it off further or maybe we have room to add more depending on where you want to go so it ends up being a tussle between money and looks that's where it's going to be and where to draw the line has a huge influence on that okay are hybrid timbers like faux timbers? Short answer, 30% of the time, yes, maybe 20. Usually it makes sense to make them structural. And I myself like to make them structural, but working for the long-term good with the owner in the driver's seat, you, know, you are the visionary, you're gonna have to make that decision which way you wanna go. Some, some people are very adamant that joints that will never be seen are done with the traditional joinery, no hidden metal, which is gonna take more time, labor, and you're gonna have more constraints with it. Other people are like, no, just give me that overall, I just want the overall vibe, because that's that's kind of how I roll, that's where I'm at. So that's another big contributor for cost. What is value engineer, engineered timber framing? Let's see where's my eraser here. Value engineered timber framing. So this is a little bit of that process where you can, so there's a couple different ways. There's, there's one value engineered for look and feel, which is what we've talked about in finding that sweet spot. 
there's another value engineered, which is if a four by four post will make the load, that is what engineers are really schooled to do to find the sweet spot structurally of what is going to make the building stand strong, last long with minimal cost, with minimal resources, which is what they're supposed to do. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to change that. The problem comes in is, is where you get daddy long legs because engineer says a four by four or six by six was more than hold the load. And that's what happens. That's what goes through the chute. That's what the builder prices and that's what gets done. And then <laughs> homeowner has to kind of solve a little tear when things are out of balance. So that's value engineering on the bad side of it. So the timber price is fluctuating with all the building, the COVID, the sawmill fires, the everything is happening with building explosion right now. Yes, we're affected by all of that. Our still costs more, our lumber costs more, the trees we buy cost more, but we have a little bit of insulation in that we have our own mill. So we can get logs before it goes through the, to the mill. So we don't have to absorb the, the constraints of the mill. We've just upgraded and we've got a big mill that can do big timbers. There was a job a while back we did. We had some 17 by 17 posts. That's, that's pretty big. And our mill couldn't go, we couldn't get free of heart. So if this is the end of the log, and it looks like little racetracks running around it, right? We had to box hard it. Our, our beam had to come out of this. Now our mill is big enough that we can cut 17 by 17 off to the side of the heart. Now, you might be asking yourself, what does that matter? So if we can get off to the heart, that means that we're not gonna have a situation, looking again from the top, where a beam will check big to the heart, and I'm gonna exaggerate and open up like this, okay? And the reason this happens, the reason what boxed heart will always have a big check, I and mean, when I'm talking big on a 17 by 17, this is three quarters of an inch. I mean, it's like stick your fingers in there. You know, grandkids might be shoving Cheerios down the crack. But if it's the look and feel you want, that rustic thing, great. If you don't want checks that big, you want, free of heart. Why? So here's why. So if you take a log, so all these growth rings are like racetracks, correct? Now, this log is going to shrink in two directions. It's going to shrink perpendicular to grain, and it's also going to shrink around the racetrack. Real technical term, isn't it? Around the racetrack, it shrinks two times more around the racetrack. And so if you have a little tiny racetrack, the shrinkage in this little tiny racetrack is gonna be a lot more than the shrinkage on this outer edge on that racetrack. So as they shrink up, it's gotta give somewhere. So pow, you get one place where it is going to open up, right? And that's where you get this on, you don't know which face it is when it's green. One other thing that makes, it can either be a thing of beauty where beams will twist and corkscrew, or it can be an eyesore depending on where you're at. But if you have boxed heart, and if the grain on the beam slopes, so when you see the checks, they're kind of at an angle like this, that means every time it checks, it's gonna, just really corkscrews. So that's what, uh, that's a little bit of a bit on the lumber we got there from the sawmill and our capacity to cut big timbers. So that was a little bit of a rabbit trail, but that may help you with your decisions about timber framing and box heart will be cheaper. In fact, if you get some real cheap prices on timbers, a lot of times they, they don't specify free of heart or box heart. It's just, you get what you get. And then you know you deal with what you deal with. Okay, have I answered this? Why does timber framing seem expensive to conventional framing? I, and, uh, I referred to the fact that I belong to a group within the 
Timbers Framing Guild and even those that don't belong, people attracted to the timber framing and the hands-on work are going to be a little bit more idealist than someone who's, you know, really on the cutting edge of green building or like styrofoam things. But, you know, if timber framing really was a viable option, it really was cheaper, it would be used a lot today. But the expansion of the Wild West, pretty much at that time in history, there were three things that made timber framing a slower, more labor intensive, more expensive way to build. What were those three things? Any guesses? Railroad. We got sawmills. Can't see that. Okay, can't see it. Sawmills and mass produced nails. Those three things right there, you had railroads that tram transport lumber that was done at sawmills, mass produced nails. It just gave open things up for, for framing as we know it, the stud framing as we know it today. I think we're at a good point here. Really glad to have you here. Glad to give you this information. Avoid waste, get what you want. That is the name of the game. Thank you.